Hey, what's up everybody? It's Justin from Chit Talk here. We just got done playing a two-player game of this little gem here, Gateway Uprising, uh, and I wanted to take a little time to tell you about it, uh, tell you my thoughts, tell you what happened, uh, and explore the game a little bit with you. So. This is a two to four player game. Uh, it's actually by a company that I've never heard of before. Uh, obviously, Seam Unlimited published it, uh, but Fish Wizard Games did a little research on them and actually found that it seems to be this group of these three people, uh, but I don't actually know too much about what they've done here. It seems like they've kind of created this world and then created a game uh, within this world, but there appears to be a lot more to it, which I'm gonna come back to when I talk a little bit about the theme uh, and more specifically, the art in this as well. So let me give you a little bit of an idea of how to play it and then I'll come back and tell you a little bit more about that. So the game plays two to four players. We just finished a two-player game here, and in a two-player game the setup is the same except you flip over these two and you ruin these. So the ruin uh, is basically the mechanic that will trigger the end game here. Uh, on your turn you're playing as, as these different warring factions who are basically trying to take over the city uh, and beat back monsters, beat back city guards, beat back the other players. So there's an area control element to it, but you'll find fairly quickly uh, that you won't control something for very long. It could even become ruined, but very quickly they become overrun by monsters, overrun by city guard, especially as they flood back into places like the central city here, uh, or other players, just kind of cherry picking uh, against weak players and kind of picking them off. Uh, but that's okay, because you really only get the benefit when you first enter a location. Um, and so getting eliminated from it and being brought back into it is really what you want to do. You don't get any points for actually holding it, and you only get the benefit for taking it. So the function here is mainly a deck builder. You can see here I've got a market laid out um, that looks very similar to what you would see in your deck builders, uh, you know, like Dominion, for example. You've got your basic cards that are always in the games, uh, these sets right here, and then also these rune cards, uh, which are shuffled up randomly. And then you're gonna choose eight of these revolution cards. Uh, the setup that we've got here uh, is one of the suggested setups in the book. It actually gives you a bunch of suggested setups in the rule book, which is very helpful. Uh, but it works very much the same in, a lot, in the way that a lot of other deck Builders do. Everyone starts with the same basic deck. You will also get a uh, faction leader card. Uh, everyone will get this, which will provide them some specific benefit. So in this particular case, I had a guy who let me upgrade my markets to higher quality markets, basically trash the one card, get a new one in there. And Eric was playing with this faction leader that lets him draw extra cards and also buy extra cards, which is very helpful. Very, very helpful. Because uh, you're actually limited to what you can do on a turn. And you'll find that in the beginning of the game, you'll spend a good bit of time kind of building up your engine and making sure that things run efficiently before you can really uh, jump in here and attack things. So you'll run through the standard deck builder stuff. You draw up your hand, you play your cards, you have your money, you've got your attack. Any uh, person who's part of your army, basically these insurgent cards, they're going to slide off to the side and they're going to be soldiers in your army which are going to last through your attacks and whatnot. So you can buy some of these generic ones here, you can also seed some into the deck over here, uh, but you're going to be mounting your attacks with them in the next phase. So once you finish buying, you can then go into uh, the attacks, and you can make at base one attack. There are also cards that modify that, let you to continue uh, moving on through the city. But attacking is sometimes not an easy feat. I mean, you look at some of these monsters here, uh, and some of these have, uh, you know, they retaliate with eight points of damage, they have six points, and these are some of the weaker monsters that we encounter. Some of these are, these are actually low level. Level. You look through here and you've actually got some that are pretty, pretty beastly. Here's a 2020. That's pretty, pretty, uh, pretty spicy. Uh, and then you've got a beast tank here. This is 1210. It's stuff like that. You'll see more of this come out as you start to play. Uh, and the city will become overrun with monsters. And this, I think, is actually one of the uh, most interesting things about this game is that on the surface, this appears to be an area control game. And while it is, sure, uh, you'll find that that is actually something that you need to coordinate with the other players. And this is something that I love in games. I love a common threat. I think it makes a game so, so interesting. Uh, and this here is no exception here in Gateway Uprising. The common threat of the monsters completely un overrunning the city and just prematurely ending the game with all players losing is very interesting. You'll find yourself coordinating with other players saying, okay, listen, if you can attack here, you can wear this down. I can sweep in here and I can finish this off. That'll eliminate the threat. Uh, and you basically have to coordinate people and let them help you in order to get the game to keep going pretty much. And that's a really interesting mechanic. Uh, I love that a lot. I think it's a very, very um, dynamic thing. 
Uh, and then also at the end of each turn, you're also going to have these events that will come out. So after you finish your attack, you're going to then move into your cleanup where an event will come out, and this will see more of those monsters into the into the city, which makes it very dangerous. If you have a city over here, like for example, if you look here, I've got a four and a five here with these district markers. This is basically, um, there are, I believe that there were maybe eight of these or something like that, but as these get put out randomly in the beginning of the game, the more markers a, a, a location has, you can see this district only has one, this one has more. So as you can start to go through some of these events, which this event deck is also randomly generated, you may get something like uh, deploy one horde monster each to districts four and six. It's very possible that this could be district four and six. So that may uh, increase your chances of something terrible happening in just there. Uh, and you may get overrun in one instant. There could be an event that completely overruns a district in one turn. You'll see that happen, which is very interesting. So that comes out, and then you have to sort of assess what's happening in the city. You have to assess, uh, you know, where you need to kind of focus your efforts, uh, whether you need to pull out of somewhere else in order to kind of uh, refocus. And that's really cool. I like that a lot. Uh, very, very clever. You go through the regular end of round stuff. You clean up, and you kind of go back and back and forth doing this uh, until you've gone through all twelve events. So in that the game becomes a little bit more about a game of survival. You're really trying to get through this event deck and stay alive while getting points doing so. You need to make sure that the game gets there. You need to make sure that the game actually has some sort of finale, otherwise it ends, everybody's done, and that's the end of the game. So that was really cool. The theme of this game uh, is really neat and comes al alive a lot with the art. Generally, I typically don't like to talk about the theme and the art, as they may not always go hand in hand, but here it really seems to be the case. Uh, the theme is really built around this world uh, that's been created by uh, this head artist here, Sean Andrew Murray. He's created this world. I checked out his website and looked at a little bit more about you know some of the world that he's done, uh, and this is really centered around that world, uh, where it's really cool. It's basically, uh, in in a nutshell, magic has been outlawed. There are these warring factions who have to beat back uh, enemies in the city as they're trying to take over the city uh, from the magic users who are in control of the city, which is uh, you know it's a neat little fantasy theme too. Uh, I like the dark fantasy. I think that that's it's cool. I think it adds a really cool aesthetic. Uh, the art is awesome. Love the art in this game, and it was one of the main selling points in me picking this up off the shelf. Which is another thing I want to talk about. I want to talk a little bit about the value of the game, and also what enticed me to pick it up off the shelf at all. So, I didn't know anything about this game. I wasn't really able to find anything about this game, and I was at my shop and said, you know, the art is really cool in this. It seems like a cheap enough game. I trust Simon as a company. You know, they make pretty good games. Let's check it out. Let's give it a shot. Uh, and I took a risk, and I'm really glad that I did. Uh, this is a really, really clever game, uh, and it's something that I may not have otherwise really checked out uh, without uh, knowing a little bit more about it. I really just picked this up kind of sight unseen. Uh, that said, I can sort of understand why I think I bought it for maybe $39, $39.99. I can see why some of the some of the, the, the choices have been made there to sort of strip things down a little bit. Uh, these are just like kind of like a little flimsy cardboard thing. Um, which is really not that big of a deal. Um, once you actually start to play on them, you realize that actually uh, the size of these is actually more important than the than the thickness of these because you don't need to play on them very long and they don't really need to do stuff. And even if they get sort of even messed up on the board, it's not that big of a deal as long as you just slide them back. Because you're not connecting anything, you're not moving from space to space, it's not important that they stay tight, uh, you know, as in something like Catan or uh, Twilight Imperium or something like that. Uh, it's not really that important, so it's no big deal. There's also, especially for being a company called Cool Mini or not, uh, there's no minis, there's just standees in here. Uh, for some people, that kind of chaps them. For me, not really that big of a deal. I don't really mind that at all. Uh, but otherwise, I'd say aside from some of these decisions that look like they kind of like made it to, to you know to kind of uh, focus on economy. Otherwise, there is a massive amount of content in this game. There is so much variability, not only in these districts that you can lay out, how they get laid out, uh, what revolution cards are seated into the game, what events are seated into the game, how it's different at different player counts. There is so much variability in, in this game, uh, and that is probably one of the most enticing things about it. Extremely clever. Look, actually, I've not even even picked out probably a third of the cards that are inside this box. There are so many more cards inside this box, uh, and they're all nicely packed into this tray. That is a really, really cool thing to me. Uh, I think the value on that is really cool. In terms of the pacing of the game, one of the things that I find very interesting is the interplay between the city guards 
and the monsters. When you start off, you've got city guards all over the city. You know, they're protecting the city from monsters. As the monsters come out, they're generally much more powerful than the city, city guards, and you'll find them completely overpowering the city guards. And once the guards are gone and they're replaced with monsters, if monsters control the city, you also lose. So that's something that you need to pay attention to. You also, some cards, for example, this summoner card lets you summon cards or summon monsters wherever you want which can be very interesting because you could summon a monster on top of city guards, send them in there, have them kill the monster, have the monster take out some of the guards in the process, and then you can kind of stroll in there on your turn and take over uh, where that was. Of course, if it's the city central or something, city guards are gonna come rushing right back in. So in terms of how the theme is carried out of you being this warring faction, these you know this, this faction of rebels, it's chaos. You can't survive, you know, as as you might not in uh, if you were uh, a warring faction in some established city. If you're trying to take over a city that's in anarchy, uh, you you can't really get a good foothold, and that comes across here really well in this game. It's madness. It's chaos. You'll be pushed out. You're gonna be, you know, it's gonna be pretty rare that you're gonna get all these guys out onto the onto the map. And to me, uh, especially when you're playing something like even the introductory game, it seems like that's not the way you're going to win. You really need to focus on just survival and points uh, and also working together with the other players to make sure you even get to a point uh, where you're going to actually be able to count your points up. So the way that theme comes across there is really, really cool. I love that a lot. In terms of accessibility, uh, you know, it's a deck builder. It's a fairly standard format, and once you've played one, it really informs you on how to play uh, a lot of the other ones. I think that one of the things that newer players may have a little bit of trouble with uh, is the tactical decisions on knowing when to coordinate with other players and when to um, when to break off from them and when to go your own route. I think that there are some decisions in here uh, that may not be super intuitive because in some cases you do rely on the other players to even get to the end so that you can even score your victory points. You might have players not sure if they're doing something that's uh, furthering the cause and trying to get to that actual end or even if they should do that at all or just throw the game and be like, I'm so far behind, we need to throw this game now, and everyone loses. Um, there's interesting decisions to be made there. I think that that's really cool, uh, but might be a little bit more difficult for newer players, um, uh, newer to the tactical decisions that, that should, could be made like that. Um, so to wrap up, I think this was a really cool game, uh, no, something I may not have normally checked out. My local store just happened to have a copy. I thought it was interesting. I was itching to try something new, and I picked this up. So really, really happy with it. Gateway Uprising, really cool game. Tons of accessibility. Uh, incorporate some new ideas into the overwrought deck building uh, sort of mechanic pool there, um, especially with this common common threat idea. I love that idea. I think it's really cool. The game can really go a lot of different ways. A ton of variability, uh, and I can see this coming out quite a bit uh, simply because of the variety. So that's it. Gateway Uprising from Simon Limited and Fish Wizard Games. My name is Justin from Chit Talk. If you uh, like our video, subscribe, check out our website, Facebook, Twitter, all that good stuff. Thanks for joining me, and we'll see you next time.